You're listening to Gift Biz Unwrapped, episode 135. My business was very much an accident. Hi, this is John Lee Dumas of Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to Gift Biz Unwrapped, and now it's time to light it up. Well, hello, and thank you for joining me on the show today. If you're a gifter, baker, crafter, or maker, and you own a brick-and-mortar shop, sell online, or are just getting started, here is where you will find insight and advice to develop and grow your business. And if you want even more Gift Biz motivation, I'd like to invite you to join our private Facebook group called Gift Biz Breeze. Pursuing your dreams should be fun, exciting, and rewarding not stressful and scary. When you join The Breeze, it's like sitting in the park with friends who bring you all the support and the answers that you need and that you've been looking for. You'll have access to a group of amazing creators along with tools and resources that can catapult your business growth. And a heads up if you're listening right now as this episode is released or shortly thereafter, you'll want to get over into that group soon. I have several special opportunities happening there right now, but you have to be part of the group to participate. I'm talking about free opportunities to affect your business this year, so don't delay. To join the group, go over to giftbizbreeze.com. I look forward to seeing you over there, but for now, let's get on to the show. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Liz Wayne of Wayne's World. In 1987, Liz's career began where most designers peak at Barney's of New York. There she made a name for herself with a single napkin. Liz evolved her couture linen collection into a lifestyle brand with a hold in more than 1,200 luxury retailers worldwide. Since then, she's been intimately involved with such brands as the Thomas Kincaid Collection of Fine Jewelry, Nostalgia Home Fashions, Inesco, Things Remembered, and more. Today, she is a sought-after consultant through her company, Wayne's World, where she works with an elite list of top world brands. Liz prides herself on building businesses through developing relevant and compelling collections of products and services. She focuses on creating and implementing strategic initiatives across branding, product design and development, and sourcing and licensing. I'm hoping today she's going to share with us some of her trade secrets and certainly her insights about the design industry of today. Liz, I am so thrilled to have you on the show. Welcome. Thanks so much, Sue. It's a pleasure to be here. So I know you know this already because you had to prep for this question, and this will be a no-brainer for you because it's a creative one. If you were to share a little bit about yourself in a different way through creating your own motivational candle, describe for us what that would look like. So what would the color of the candle be? And then what would be a quote that you would put on your candle? Well, my candle would most definitely be an off-white pillar that would be inscribed on it, the Theodore Herzl quote, if not now, when? I like the idea of surrounding my environment in a blank slate, something that I can transform into whatever the mood is or whatever mood that I want to create. The purity that goes along with a white candle allows for unlimited possibilities and just gives you a good place to think forward and create the world that you want. It's a perfect start for us, Liz, because a lot of the people who are listening right now are now thinking about a business or perhaps they've started a business and they're listening because they want more motivation. But in the beginning, especially when you decide you're going to go off on your own, it is a blank slate, right? You can create anything you want. The scary part sometimes, though, is how do you start? Like you think you have to be perfect right from the beginning, right? So to talk about maybe your canvas, just picking that first color and making that first stroke, even in a business can be kind of hard. Talk to us a little bit about how your career began way back, I'm thinking in the late 1980s, I'm guessing, right? Oh, yeah, actually, before that, it's interesting when you think about it, because I think you bring up a really important piece here, which is just the scariness taking that first jump. And I had a lot of good luck. And my business was very much it came out of an accident. But anybody who knows me and watched me grow up really would not be surprised. I was very entrepreneurial as a kid. 
I actually sold the most Girl Scout cookies in Los Angeles. Oh, you were one of those. (laughs) Yes, back in the early 70s. I can sell ice to Eskimos, but I have to love that ice. So I was always very entrepreneurial. I ran a business in high school and I always was very creative. For a sixth grade graduation, I got to decorate my room and I found bed sheets that I loved right away, but my mother wanted to wallpaper the room. And it took about two years for me to find a wallpaper that I could agree to wallpaper my room with. So my mother should have known very early on that I had <laughs> very particular taste and I knew what I wanted. I just took a while in finding it. So it's interesting because I went to university and I have a degree in economics and city planning. I had my eyes on business school and this seemed it was a soft way to actually get myself into investment banking, which was kind of what I always thought that I would do being a child of the 70s. But interestingly enough, came time to shop for college and I had a hard time finding bed sheets. And so I didn't like the choices that were out there. And at the time, I remember it took quite some time, but I found this brand new brand, Mary Mecco. And I bought those sheets. I actually still have them today. I use them in terms as a painting. Okay, can I just tell you that my college bed sheets are also Mary Mecco and I also still have them. Oh, you're kidding me. I'm not even kidding you. (laughs) I bet we have the same one. So anyway, that's so funny. But back in the 70s, prints were not what they are today. And there wasn't the range in the selection. And anyhow, so I was on my way to get my MBA and I took a turn and a course of events happened. And I decided actually to go to New York and pursue a career in design. And I had convinced my family that I could actually have a year at design school and get a great job in textile design. So you were already in college and then you're like, this is not really working for me. My passion is somewhere else. And so you made that switch through college, right? Well, actually, I graduated college with honors with a degree in economics and had applied and been accepted to get my MBA. Oh, so you were well on the road when you made the change. I deferred my admittance and I convinced my grandparents that they should support me for a year in New York and I could get a great job. And so they said, fine. And I ended up going to Parsons and I studied surface pattern design because I wanted to design bed sheets, but dating back to I couldn't find sheets that I liked. And as the situation would have it, at the end of my year, my grandmother, I remember her writing me a letter and reminding me that I had agreed to a year of school and that I would find a great job. And so I did, in fact, find a job selling printed fabric, not designing fabric. So I ended up getting a job in decorative fabric selling it. I want to stop you here real quick, because this is really important for all of us to always continue to remember is when you were just going on your normal day, right, you were getting ready for college, you had identified whether you knew it or not, Liz, a need in the market that if you had, possibly other people had, which was you couldn't find what you wanted, you couldn't find the designs that you liked. And instead of just glossing over that, you recognize that as an opportunity. So I would challenge anyone who's listening who is thinking they want to get into something, but they're not sure what it is, keep that radar up. What is it as you go along your life? Are you looking at that you can't find exactly what you need or you're trying to do something and it's really hard to do? That could be an idea that could trigger a whole business for you, just as it did for Liz. The other thing that I think was really good, Liz, is your grandmother challenging you and saying, okay, now you've got your degree. Now you said you were going to get the job. So she almost pushed you into action whether you were going to do it or not. Well, accountability is a big thing. So I think we all need to surround ourselves with a method to hold us accountable because you can kind of get lost and go down too many detours. But I think something that you bring back to, which I've never really thought of, is that I think that one of the biggest reasons to start a business is to find a void in the marketplace. And this is something that I talk to people about all the time when they are deciding whether or not to start a business or not. And so if you have a void, if you have identified a void and you have an ability to fill that void, that is a big trigger to actually start a business. 
I, subliminally, I'm not exactly sure that I, back in the early 80s, had quite gone after that point. But let's just say kismet. <laughs> kind of got you there. <laughs> it, it absolutely <laughs> did. But fast forward a few years, it's interesting because I was reading an article about a gal who sold decorative fabric. And my mother had told me that if I ever read an article about somebody that I thought I'd like to meet, that I should always write them back a letter. This is back before there was email or anything. We're talking 1985 and tell them that you want to meet them. And that's actually what I did. I wrote this total stranger a letter. She had an article about her in a magazine. I found her address. I probably called the magazine and found out how to contact her. And I made a meeting and we met and she liked me and she gave me a job. The interesting thing that I can relate back to the world today is that appearances are not always as they seem because this article that was in a home furnishings magazine made this gal look like a big, fancy fabric manufacturer when in fact, truth is, she was a trust fund baby who wanted to have a fine art career. She was actually painting fabric and upholstering fabric as a means to launch a fine art career. And she gave me a job earning $10 an hour to do her books. Not that I knew the first thing about accounting, but I read the first chapter of an accounting book and I basically became her best friend and used to hang out with her all the time. Interestingly enough, this gal who was very well connected, another person wrote an article about her. It wasn't really an article about her, but rather think about when you're looking through the pages of Bon Appetit or Food and Wine. There's the recipe of the chicken that you are going to make, but it's also displayed on a plate with silverware and a napkin. And what had happened is this editor had taken one of my friend's painting rags, literally one of her painting rags, and she ironed it and used it as a napkin. And so back in the day when you were part of a magazine article, there was in the back of the magazine a list of resources and you would write the magazine and tell them you wanted more information about the product. And so what we got back were these triplicate forms of labels to send back information to inquiring readers. To inquiring readers who wanted to know about how they could purchase a rag napkin. Exactly. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> I can compare this to the internet and everybody is mad about social media and looking at Snapchat and Instagram and you're all thinking, wow, how do I look this good? And how can I come across this way? You know, sometimes it's just an accident <laughs> or sometimes it's really just Trump Loy and that it doesn't really exist. And that's one of the things I think that this generation of entrepreneur can really, you can create a business out of thin air. So again, if you will it, it is no dream. If not now, when? So I literally suggested to my friend that, well, all we have to do is put together a tear sheet of six styles of these napkins and you can sell them. And she wanted to have income. She didn't want to just be taking money from her trust. And I said, you want a business? Here's a business. And she's like, well, I don't have any interest in doing this. You should do this. I'm like, I can't do this. You should do it. And so we did this back and forth. And anyway, she wasn't going to do it. And fast forward, I did it. And a complete and total accident. And less than a year later, my product was in Barney's. Then I was in Bergdorf's. Then I started doing the complete assortment of table linens. We did bath towels. We started doing baby bedding, adult bedding, and it turned into a whole lifestyle brand. So it was really very much an accident. This is a spectacular story. First, before we go into this with all these questions that I have for you, Liz, I just want to make this point that you'd mentioned that when you see someone who's published in a magazine or their online presence looks so stellar, they look like this star in their field. It doesn't mean that they're not, but it doesn't mean either that they're not approachable. And it's really important to remember because think about it for yourself. I mean, you put up always the best things on social media or wherever you are. Everyone's seen the edited reel of your life and your career. And Liz's example in terms of being a letter, here it could be maybe in this day and age, a tweet or connecting up with them through direct message on Instagram or whatever it is. 
people can still be approached and they're honored many times when people do approach them. So I think it's probably something not many people do, Liz. And I think it's a great thing that you brought up. Well, I think it's really important for everybody to remember that we're all people and we all started somewhere. I mean, very few people are Dylan Lauren, Ralph Lauren's daughter of Dylan Candy, who had a father who was the king of design, merchandising and licensing. So most of us started literally from nothing and built a business and how we've come through that journey. Each of us are different for our experiences, but I will tell you that it's always an honor to be able to help others along that journey and to give back and pay forward. Another thing about my story, I think that's really kind of important to share is that I like to call myself the first Jewish son. And there were great things expected of me growing up. I was very verbal. That's a burden in a way. Well, I will tell you that I do believe had I not moved to New York City, an entire continent away from my family, I don't know that I would have started this business. There was nobody watching every little step. I had a lot of independence. I was on my own. I got to make my own mistakes and correct my own mistakes. And my family was very, very supportive, but I didn't have to endure their continual scrutiny because there was no scrutiny. Got it. In that, I think that that was a big thing for me because I had the freedom to create and to make my mistakes and not have them gone over. It wasn't a constant discussion every Sunday night at family dinner. But Liz, how did you then stay motivated? I'm sure there were some times when it was frustrating or you weren't sure what to do. Like, how did you, is it just something that's already innate in you that keeps you going? I'm pretty focused and I'm pretty motivated. So I would say that that's not something that I needed somebody to light a fire under me. As my business grew, going back ahead, I think that it's important to surround yourself with your trusted people, your board. Early on, it was suggested to me that I gather people with whom I trusted from a variety of disciplines who could advise me in the big decisions that I made. And so I was lucky that I had a group of mentors, if you will, from across my life that really helped guide me. And I think that that was a big thing. I want to stop you here for just a second, too, in that having some people who have a different eye on your business, they're looking at it from a different perspective is super valuable, Liz. I mean, that's a lot of reasons why people will hire business coaches. They need someone who's understanding what they're doing, but is sitting a little bit outside of the business. Now, when you actually create a business, you don't legally need to have a board of directors unless you're going to be a corporation. But even if you're an LLC or an S Corp, It's not a bad idea, like Liz has just been sharing here, to gather some people. Maybe they're not involved in the intimate numbers behind your business, but grab a couple people who come from different disciplines where you can all share each other's businesses, challenges, etc. This type of a concept is now called masterminding, right? And you can certainly create something like that for yourself. And Liz is sharing here how valuable it's been to her. Absolutely. One thing I remember very clearly about my early days of being in business and my peers who were also thinking about doing businesses, my business was very much an accident. It literally, an opportunity happened. I took advantage of that opportunity. And then I worked really, really hard honing and fine tuning. And I learned a lot along the way. But I also watched several friends think their businesses to death. And I remember thinking back to a girlfriend of mine from university who was actually getting her MBA, and she saw this really cool ring watch in Europe when she had been traveling on vacation. And she wanted to make that a reality in the U.S. because we didn't have those over here at the time. This is, again, back in the mid-80s. And I remember her putting together a whole business school plan for this business and the financing and everything around it. And by the time she got done with it, it was already in the market. So I think that there is something to be said about it when you identify a void, then to be able to jump on it and make things happen. Excellent point. 
Let's go back to the single napkin, which now it's all clear. <laughs> I said that in the intro and I didn't know, know the story. And now I like the story even more. But if someone is sitting in that type of a situation right now, they've identified, they've been thinking about something. What are the first steps that you would take to start taking some action? Let's say someone really isn't sure. They have the idea, but they're not sure what to do. Do you start right away and establish a company? Do you start a prototype? Like, how would you get started with this? How did you get started with the napkin? What were the first steps? To fine tune my story a little bit, I actually received, and again, I made it up as I went. So what the nuts and bolts of the story are that I had received a directory for all the bed, bath and linen companies that were in the marketplace. And it was an annual directory and all the subscribers were asked to list their businesses in this directory. And so I filled out a form and I had, this is before my business was started and even before I even conceived the business. And I made up a business and I called it Liz Wayne Designs. And they said, what do you make? And they probably had about 50 product categories that you would circle what you manufactured. And so I literally went through and circled every single category I thought that I could hand paint because that's what the member going back to the Bon Appetit food spread, it was a hand painted napkin in the food spread. And so I probably circled maybe 20 or 25 different categories and I mailed back this form and I completely forgot about it. So when fast forward, I'd say four or five months, I'm picking up my mail and I'm looking at my mail and I'm going to date myself here. I turn on my phone machine and I listen to my messages and there's a message from the corporate buyer at Macy's who wants to make an appointment to see my line. And you have no line, right? I don't even know what the guy's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to see my line. And so I'm literally in my bedroom with my mail in my hands and there's this like two inch thick book and I'm going through the book and there I am in black and white, Liz Wayne Designs and they have my address and I have, it's probably a three inch ad or posting listing because I didn't pay for it. And everybody else's listing is like a half of an inch because they make three things. They make pot holders, kitchen aprons and towels, but I make everything. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm like, wow, look at this. And so again, I had the gift for Gab. I was always very like on the spot. And so I called back the person who had left the message. And I told him that I would be creating my new spring collection and I would be happy to preview it for it prior to market. And we made an appointment for him to see my new spring line. And that was that. And I called my then boyfriend who eventually became my husband. And I said, Eric, Eric, I've got an appointment to show Macy's my line. He's like, what line? I said, my line, my line, I can't change a napkin. Oh, and this is like, great. <laughs> what are you talking about? And I said, my line of hand-painted napkins. He's like, you don't have one. I said, I know, but I will. So what ended up happening? And granted, I knew a lot of I had been keeping my eyes open. I was in this industry peripherally. I mean, I was a kid. I was 24, 25 years old in New York. I was all over town. I was looking and being aware of things. But I went to a trade show and I found several different types of napkins. And I decided that I liked hemstitch napkins. And hemstitch are the hand-drawn pulled threads that people's grandmothers, they learned how to do this in school. So I identified a fabricated napkin that I liked in a placemat, and I literally bought three dozen of each. And I hold myself up in my then boyfriend's medical school dorm. And in two weekends, I put together a line of you know, like 10 napkins and 10 placemats. And I went off and I showed the buyer the line. He bought it. I quit my job and I started a business. So I guess I got lucky and he bought the line. So you were showing him your original pieces. What do you do then to actually get it to be a mass product that then can be in 1,200 luxury retailers? My collection, my couture collection, as I referred to it, was always hand-painted one at a time with a brush. And initially, I painted everything myself. And then when the demand for my product grew, I started to hire people that I went to design school with. And then I started to hire other people. And the business grew over time. 
so again, it was kind of a lot of crazy things happened. And I got this initial order. Macy's Herald Square was reopening. They had gone through this major renovation. And so my napkins were purchased to kind of highlight, be the showcase around this new department. And so my first order was for five dozen placemats and five dozen napkins. And probably took me, I don't know, three weeks to paint those pieces. And then I went and I went to Los Angeles where I was from. And I went to the store where my mother registered for linens. And I showed them my samples and they placed an order. So then I had to paint that order. And then every time I went to a new town, when I went to visit my future in-laws, I went to the fancy bridal registry in West Hartford and they bought my linens. So I was having a big stroke of luck everywhere I went, purchased my stuff. And then another moment of serendipity, I lived about five blocks from Barney's and I went into Barney's just to kind of survey the land. It was very intimidating to me. I mean, I was a kid with no money and I knew Barney's was a fancy store, but I also knew I couldn't afford anything in the store. But I went in nonetheless and I checked out the linen department and the manager of the linen department stopped me and she asked me, and she started to talk to me and I was asking her about these napkins. While people have called me the mother of the hand-painted niche and home furnishings. I'm not the first person to paint a napkin. And there was a line of napkins there that were hand-painted, and I inquired about those napkins. The manager was telling me how they didn't sell, and she couldn't give them away. And I said, well, I have a line of hand-painted napkins, but they look nothing like this at all. And so she actually said, well, I'd love to see them. We made an appointment. And again, I had to come up with something completely different because the line of napkins that were there were very contemporary. And my initial collection was very contemporary. And so they were very whimsical. So what ended up happening is I came up with the idea to just create a solid border around a hemstitch napkin, which is when you refer to a single napkin. That's my gold border, solid border napkin was really what launched my business. You know, when I listen to your story, there are two words that come out to me. One is courage and the other is bravery <laughs> because <laughs> darn, it's like scary to walk all the different steps that you did, but you did it anyway. Had you not, had you rethought it or like, oh, it's just me, they'll never be interested. You didn't do any of that. You took a step each and every time. It didn't even occur to me. I, a, I had no reason to be scared. I was a kid. I didn't know any different. For people who are older, it is scary. Absolutely. But I figured, why not? Just go for it. It kind of goes back to don't overthink this. Please don't. You have something and you like it and your friends like it. Go with it. I mean, give it a shot. But your question to go back is how do you go about doing all this is that you have to have a sense of what the marketplace is and what things cost. So when I went into Barney's and they had this very whimsical napkin and it didn't sell, I knew that I needed to come back with something that was truly very simple, very tailored. And I came back with an idea that was completely the opposite. What I ended up showing her, she ended up buying and she bought a lot of it because she wanted an exclusive from Bergdorf Goodman. And so at the time I sold her... I want to say like $10,000 worth of two items, which back then was a lot. And I said that she could have a six month exclusive and not sell it to Bergdorf's. The big thing that really happened that cemented the launching of this business was that I delivered these napkins to Barney's the week before the tabletop show. Now, I didn't even know that Again, this was a lot of kismet, but back in the day when buyers would come to New York to tabletop market, they would come in early and they would go to Bergdorf's and they would go to Barney's and they would see what lines these stores had. And they would then look to the marketplace to try to purchase these lines. These two stores were truly the trend setting stores in the country. And because I was in Barney's and I also was at the tabletop show, it was my first trade show, people would come into my booth and they would say, are these the napkins at Barney's? And I would say yes. And they'd write an order. 
Now, I had no idea any of that was going to happen. So I think today it's a little different. I mean, you say don't think it to death, but you do need to be aware of what's going on in the marketplace and what the trade shows are or how to bring your product to market. And there's many ways to do that now, which were not, didn't even exist back in the day when I started my business. But similarly to being in Barney's or Bergdorf's, you've got influencers out there. There's still retail stores that are highly coveted. You've got websites, you've got all different ways that you can get people to find out about your product. You can buy followers. I mean, you can go online and if you have a strategy, a web strategy such that you actually can get out in front of people, push your Instagram or your Facebook to a broader audience. I mean, there's ways that you can get word out about your product, depending on who your customer. I want to make sure to make this point really clear in terms of buying followers through social media. Please, you guys, don't fall prey to give me $500 and I'll get you 5,000 followers because half of those are bots and they're not worth it. I think what Liz is referring to is Facebook ads are targeting to your correct community. So you're spending money to attract the right audience. But please don't go the other way because that is just setting you up for a whole lot of trouble down the road. Sue, I think it's important to be a very aware consumer. So heed Sue's advice on this very specifically. So Liz, all of this sounds so great. And there are challenges, there are road bumps along the way. Can you share with us something that has happened that makes us think you're even human? That you didn't just take all these actions and everything turned into gold and rainbows? While much of my early business success was an accident, I'm an incredibly strategic planner with always a plan B. Before I even knew what a plan B was, I was always prepared for a rainy day. When I started my business, I was very strategic in how I opened new accounts. Barney's took a tremendous amount of care and a lot of attention to service that account, as did Bergdorf's that I opened a year later. And I opened every account with the same care and attention that I opened those. And some people had to wait over a year in order to receive my product. But I made sure that I only grew as fast as I could grow to service these accounts as I brought them on in. Was there something, though, that didn't work? Can you bring us to a story of a challenge or something that really got messed up that you had to fix or some type of a story like that? I imported all of my linen from Europe. And there was, we had to plan an order in advance. And we're talking years ago now, so it wasn't as easy as it is now in terms of timing and getting it over, I would imagine. Well, we had to plan our production. And so we would plan out three months, six months. After a couple of years, you kind of had a sense of the business cycle, But we ran into a problem where we lost a complete shipment of linen. And I ran out of linen at the same time that the demand for my product was increasing and our sales were going up. And I had to switch suppliers at our busiest time of year. And that ended up being an enormous mess. And so there were limited ways where I could actually get the product that we painted on. And so I basically bought every piece of hemstitched linen that I could get my hands on from the three or four people that would import it into the United States. And what ended up happening in the end, because it was so stressful, is that I ended up keeping a year's inventory of linen on hand at all times so that whether it was a weather problem or a linen problem or you lose a shipment. Yeah, so that never happened again. No, but I owned probably $100,000 worth of blank linen at any one time. And for a relatively small business, that was a huge investment. But it was one that was worth making because without the linen, we couldn't ship our product. Yeah. And let's face it, you are working with some really prestigious companies. And if you weren't able to fill their orders when they asked for it, you're not going to have much of a future. Well, and we were considered one of the most knocked off companies in the marketplace. It was very easy to replicate our product because it was literally a piece of hemstitched linen that was painted. 
So, but I'm very proud to say that none of our premier retailers bought knockoff product. They stayed with us. And we always, we had a signature product that we continued to deliver on time. And that was important to me and to make sure that people were serviced correctly. So this is interesting, Liz, because you could be knocked off. People could try and replicate what you're doing and offer it at a lower price, but they stayed with you. Was it because of the service? Partly the service. I think a lot of it had to do with the service. It had to do with our integrity. Very clearly known as the originator. It was my idea and we grew that business and I made a lot of friends and I did favors for everybody. I really made myself indispensable to the people who were loyal to me. And so I think that that had a big part of it. Excellent. You know, relationships. Lots of times it always comes back to the relationships, right? Well, absolutely. And I'm still, I closed my couture business in 2000. And I still keep relationships with those people. And many of those people are the people who have since brought me business as a consultant. So I think that one's network is key and talk about like how to build a business. And to me, it's it's all about who you know, and how you can help them. And eventually, one day, they'll probably help you. This is a perfect segue into a conversation that you and I had had before we started recording here, and that is things are so different today. It used to be in the past that you had to get the eye of a top line design name or something like that, and you were sharing with me your thoughts of how you feel things have changed. Can you talk about that a little bit with our listeners? Well, so much of the world today is in part social media. It is so important to have a very clean and focused and directed presence. Your website or your Instagram is your digital business card, if you will. But at the end of the day, it all comes back to the integrity of the brand and the integrity of the product. And so you have this opportunity to get your message out to millions and millions of people with a click, but it needs to be authentic and it needs to be able to convey the true essence of your brand, your product. So it really, in the end, circles back to the same reason that I started my business and became successful was that I had an original idea that was a quality product it was unique in the marketplace, and it was sold through channels where people were interested. And that's not to say that you have to be at Barney's or Bergdorf's. I think that it's important to focus on understanding who your customer is. And that's really the first question that I talk to any client about today is understanding who is your client and what do they want and how do I get it to them? And that's where we start and we build a strategic plan around beginning a business, around evolving a business, growing a business. A lot of time my clients come to me because they have identified a void in the marketplace, but they don't know how to take their business in a new direction to solve that. Or I have people that have a great idea for a business, but don't know how to actually manufacture the product. There's all sorts of different reasons to start a business and there's all sorts of different reasons to seek help or guidance. But again, maintaining that focus and the integrity in an authentic quality idea is really key. Yeah. And I think what you're also saying here is that you don't need to sit back like it used to be. Although I didn't hear any part of your story where you sat back and waited, <laughs> but you don't have to wait to get noticed or recognized. You can initiate all of it. Absolutely. You have to have your brand defined. You have to have something, if people are interested, somewhere to take them so that they can see. But that could be as simple as going into your local gift store and showing them this new product that you have a concept of and having them buy it and test it. There's nothing like getting customer feedback to understand what's great about your product and how you refine your product. I mean, the first napkins that I shipped to Barney's, or when I say shipped, actually walked to Barney's, <laughs> are a lot different than the ones I sold two months later. My product clearly evolved very quickly because we got customer feedback. So I encourage people with new ideas to put together a prototype, you know, put together a couple dozen, take them, show them. 
there's so many opportunities today with local farmers markets or craft shows, holiday shows, or even local regional gift shows where you can actually talk to merchants, to store owners, get feedback on your idea, and you can evolve your concept. It doesn't have to stay exactly the same way. In fact, if it does stay exactly the same way, you're probably not doing something right. Right. It needs to change with the times, with what's in fashion, for example, or customer base might change. All the above. With my business, with Liz Wayne, I will say that every two to three years, we introduce an entirely new product category because your customers need to see something new. They need to see that you are evolving. They might not buy it. They might only buy what they used to buy. But the newness is what's going to drive the growth of your business. Agree with you 100%. Okay, as we wind down here, I want to bring you in just a little bit of a different direction, kind of similar, but a little bit different, because I think this will really, really help people who are right on the edge. They're like, I get what Liz is saying, but I can't do that. Like, how would I do this? So share with us a little bit, if you were advising someone, when you say, take them, show them, okay? A lot of our listeners go to craft shows, maybe even a little bit more organized, larger trade shows. But in terms of walking into your local gift shop, or kitchen shop, or whatever relates in terms of a product. Get down to like specifics. Do you just, what would you suggest they do? Walk in, call first, what do you say? Walk through a little bit of that for us. Well, I'll take you through my experience, and I think that it works somewhat the same way. I think you have to understand who your customer is, and you need to see what's resonating or what they're doing well with. So do your homework. I think that you should be aware of the retailers in your area or the craft shows. Understand what the environment is. So for instance, if you want to sell to your local artisan gift store, you need to be aware of how they merchandise. You need to have a sense of what they're doing well with. Or if you're going to be at a local renegade craft fair or market. Understand what booths look like. What do the displays look like? Be prepared and understand what you like about how other people are merchandising their product and take away from that how you would envision your product in that same kind of a space. So that when you do go to a craft show or you do go into a gift store, you are able to present your product in a way that elevates your product and speaks to the customer, be it the owner of a gift store or the people that are walking a craft show. So if I was going into my local gift store and I had a line of linens, I would make sure that I had them presented, able to show it in a way that elevated the product, that showed the product off at its best. So when you walk in the store, I'm trying to get really tactical here. So do you already have your product with you or do you walk in and find out who the owner or who you would speak with and have an informal conversation or do you come prepared for the whole meeting then? I don't like to catch anybody by surprise. So I would identify the store in your town where you would like to actually sell your product. And then I would understand the products that the store has. I would see how my products were different. I would find out who the owner of the store is. And I would probably either send that person an email or send them a phone call and make an appointment to show them your product. I would call and introduce yourself and say, I have this new collection of lovely linens. And I think that they would compliment your dinnerware. And I would know what dinnerware they had. I would be ready to say why your product was different than the actual linens that they had in their store. Give the owner a reason to take the appointment. And then once you get that appointment, you would go in there and be prepared to show your linens along with the dinnerware that they have in the store, maybe show them how they can be used in napkin rings, understand how your product is different, differentiated, how it's going to help this store owner make more money. Well said. (laughs) So we are going to wind down here. I'm looking at the time. What advice would you give that newbie who's listening to you right now, Liz, who really wants to jump in 
they're still a little bit uncertain if they should or they shouldn't, what piece of advice would you give them? Trust your gut. If you see that you have an idea and it's not out there in the marketplace and you have discussed this with colleagues, friends, family, and they think it's a good idea, why not give it a whirl? I'm not saying quit your day job, but I think that there's plenty of time to turn a passion into a business. I mean, I've been very blessed in that I don't consider myself somebody who goes to work because I love what I do. And I've had the incredible opportunity to make my passion my financial living. And I think that there's no greater joy than being able to do that. So if not now, when? There you go. Well, and now, Liz, I'm going to dare you to reach even further by daring to dream about your future. I'd like to present you with a virtual gift. It's a magical box containing unlimited possibilities for your future. So this is your dream or your goal of almost unreachable heights that you would wish to obtain. Please accept this gift on behalf of myself and the listeners and tell us what would be in your box. Well, I love making new things and there's limitless possibilities out there, but I like being given a blank canvas. And I would love the opportunity to relocate myself and reinvent myself every couple years and go off to a faraway land for six months. The first place I'd like to go is Sicily. I'm recently remarried and my husband is Sicilian and we met his family in Sicily last year. And I would love to purchase a home and start a, a second life there and create some sort of an environment, whether it's possibly either a restaurant or a little shop or a combination of the two, maybe a nursery. I love to garden, but a way to meet the people, a way to get involved in the culture and the lifestyle. And I would love to, after a few years, go somewhere else and do it again. To me, traveling has been one of the incredible gifts that I've been afforded by my profession. And the people that I've met across the globe have taught me so much about their way of life and have helped me grow as a better person and more fully. And I'd like to be able to continue to do that. I love that. A blank canvas and you've been a creator your whole life. So you just keep creating. That's where your passion is. If someone was really interested and wanted to connect with you, what would be the best way for them to reach out? Well, I think the easiest way would be to send me a message via LinkedIn. I'm a big believer in LinkedIn, and I think that it's really a very valuable tool in developing your own professional network. And so please, I invite anybody here who has a specific question or something that I can help you with to send me a message via LinkedIn. I was kind of thinking you were going to say write a letter. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like, if you want to, I guess. <laughs> like you did way back in the day, right? <laughs> We've advanced a little bit from snail mail. So yeah, LinkedIn is pretty quick. <laughs> okay. And Gift Biz listeners, of course, you know, there'll be a show notes page. The link will be there as well as all the other pieces of information and tidbits that we've talked about during this interview. So Liz, appreciate so much all of the information. Love your story. It's so unique, so interesting. You've given our listeners quite a bit of information that they can take then and move forward. And listeners, I'm challenging you, choose a color, make that first line on that blank slate for yourself and your future and your own business. Liz, once again, thank you. And may your candle always burn bright. Thank you, Sue. I've enjoyed this very much. Today's show is sponsored by the Ribbon Print Company. Looking for a new income source for your gift business? Customization is more popular now than ever. Brand your products with your logo or print a Happy Birthday Jessica ribbon to add to a gift right at checkout. It's all done right in your shop or craft studio in seconds. Check out the ribbonprintcompany.com for more information. After you listen to the show, if you like what you're hearing, make sure to jump over and subscribe to the show on iTunes. That way you'll automatically get the newest episodes when they go live. And thank you to those who have already left a rating and review. 
By subscribing, rating, and reviewing, you help to increase the visibility of Gift Biz Unwrapped. It's a great way to pay it forward to help others with their entrepreneurial journey as well. And one final reminder, a repeat from the top of the show, make sure to go over and join Gift Biz Breeze. Lots of opportunity for sales growth this holiday season, and I certainly don't want you to miss it. Just jump over to giftbizbreeze.com and request to join. I'll see you over there.